Hey guys, welcome back. Hey guys, brand new podcast. Hey, wait a minute. It's my podcast. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I forgot. Enjoy. I kept thinking about that when the three of us were in here and you so eloquently said to Sandy that you have seen uh, so many parts and people of the world that you never would have without her friendship. And I just yeah. kept thinking about that when I was seeing all of those pictures. It's very you. true. That's really... Um, She's been a gift to me, really, a real gift, and I cherish her, and I don't feel like um, I need to hold her, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, if she needs to, if for whatever reason we stop hanging out, and this was just what was supposed to happen in this phase of my life, what a gift. She's been a real gift in so many ways. I think, I think, honestly, I've not had a friend care for me the way that she cares for me. You know, and she's by no means perfect. I'm not perfect either. Right, right. But one of the things she does that only one friend in middle school was that way, where they consider and care in a mm. specific way, mm-hmm. you know, where you go, mm-hmm. I really feel like I mm-hmm. am um, important to her in, the, in that way. And of course you are. Not necessary, but important, which is it makes it a That's choice. Me. Yeah. When the, because it's a choice, it's even more valuable. Yeah. You know what That's I mean? That's a good delineation. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels she chooses, she chooses me. Halston's saying to talk, bring your oh, mic active. closer. Okay. Um, but, um, but anyway, it was a real gift, that trip to Vietnam. And Sandy, uh, Sandy, Jeannie gave Sandy and I $50 each to buy treasures in Vietnam. Uh-huh. So next week, she, Jeannie's coming, and we're going to give her the treasures and then talk about the whole trip. Oh, what fun. Yeah, so it'll be fun. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That'll be really good. So, um, so yeah, anyway, it was, it was really great. amazing. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. That's so great. You look so happy today. I do? Yes. Well, I'm having... <clears throat> A little bit of a podcast <clears throat> existential crisis. What? Well, well, how so? Well, this is my third podcast. Yes. And I feel, first of all, I'm horrified that anybody would want to listen to me speak. You're crazy. Okay. No. And I'm also now in yellow yeah. because I can't stand seeing myself on on camera yeah. or on anything. Yeah. And I was like, this is like... A horror this is horrifying right here. okay so this is horrifying and i actually I, I, anyway but i feel it feels so self-indulgent and i feel like you are it's so, i mean talk about a gift like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you know Aww, and that's you so are nice. and you are um you're very good Aww. at this well, and thank you, you have a beautiful way of listening and then of um, sharing and encouraging um, such beautiful and deep thought on whatever you're bringing up and you're very articulate. So I'm having a bit of a crisis because I'm not very articulate. I don't think that's true at all. I'm not. But see, even this, even this, somebody is listening to this right now. Yeah. And they are hearing me like vomit, self-indulgent crap. No, I I think you have, maybe you should think about opening your paradigm a bit. (laughs) Because, because. I'm very safe in my small paradigm. No, 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 no. No, but. My paradigm. But. I don't want to open it. But uh, you may, just a little bit. No, no. Okay, maybe a little little bit. Because my perspective about what you just said is there's someone who feels that way about themselves. Mm-hmm. And when I started this podcast, Bert said, just sit with a mic and talk. You have so much to say. And I you tried do. that and I finished it and I went, I, that was the most self-indulgent thing I have yeah. ever done. I can't do that. I said, I cannot do that. What I can do is have meaningful conversations with people who are deep thinkers and who have processed through things in life and and share that with somebody okay so my i i would never think of you as being self-indulgent i would think of you as the opposite as being able to share so that other people can benefit and that's that's i and i've mentioned this before here that that's that's why i think we're alive 
honestly. A hundred percent. Is to share stories. A hundred percent. And also, and I think the reason I was also feeling about this is that I feel very mixed. Um, as was just exhibited by my pause there. <laughs> I feel very mixed about discussing my battle with depression. You do? Um, I feel mixed because... the the wonderful i have i have been through like we all have difficult difficult things mm-hmm. and the gift from it is for me is to be able to be there for others that right. have been there yeah and to be able to really look in somebody's eyes and say i i know i'm i hear you and what you're feeling is real, and I have been there, and I'm on the other side. And also in talking about my depression and my battle with it, it's not something, it's something I will talk to any stranger about. Right. In depth. Right. I have been a spokesperson for the Mental Health Association back in the day. I've given speeches and all sorts of stuff on it. Mm -hmm. But because I haven't had any real severe depressive episode in quite some time, Mm -hmm. my community here doesn't really know about it. Right. And... No, I had no idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's easier for me to talk about it here Mm -hmm. with you. Right. In more of like a podcast world I guess yeah then it would be to talk to anybody that I just had a delightful conversation with at school that right, I run right. into all the time I so I guess that's why I feel um but it's so important to me it is so important to me to be able to be there for people that have suffered with it right because I think it is a suffering it, it is a suffering it that, is a deep suffering yeah i think so um from someone who has never really had depression Mm -hmm. i've been depressed Mm -hmm. i've been sad i've been heartbroken Mm -hmm. but i've never had chemical depression i had postpartum Mm -hmm. but for me i got really angry right i didn't get uh um incapacitated yeah uh for someone in my first podcast I did about depression, I was very honest in saying I realized I had an unconscious bias mm. about depression because I kept, I would always say, well, I don't get it. What? You can't get in the shower? Mm. What do you mean? I mean, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Mm. You don't have a choice. There's a baby crying in the other room. Get mm-hmm. get up. You mm-hmm. know, what, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. But for people like me to understand, to be able to hear people who have real depression is important i think because you can't you can't i th- i don't think i can change my behavior anyway until i understand something better does that make sense absolutely i can't just go oh well yeah i'm gonna get pass you you get a pass for that mm-hmm. i don't my i don't function that way anyway mm-hmm. i have mm-hmm. to f- understand something and go oh okay that's cool that you know that about yourself I, I don't I don't get That's it. That's your recipe for empathy. That's cool. Oh well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't really think about myself having. I feel like I'm a really unbiased person. Absolutely, you are. But I think I did have some biases I didn't realize I had about depression because mm. my depression for postpartum wasn't incapacitating. I just was angry right all the time. Right. It's interesting because I think. Um, part of the struggle with depression is that at least for me I've I am very similar to you in that I'm like I mean that's how that's how I felt a kinship with you Mm -hmm. was working on the world fair and I like saw you and I'm like oh that's a woman that just rolls up her sleeves and just does it and that's very much like me too it's like just let's just get this people yeah moving on moving on on. this is make it happen (laughs) right and um that is a huge part of me yeah and that is a pro that is makes my suffering with depression all the harder i bet because that 
that part of me is also very real. Right. And I have, I was diagnosed with it um, when I was 18, 30 years ago. And uh, I didn't, I... So what led up to your diagnosis? <clears throat> what happened that um, that required that you be diagnosed? Um, if you don't mind talking about no, it. No, that's why I'm here. Um, and it's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you for talking about it. You're welcome. Because and thank you, you for your be brave. patience for listening to me say um a lot because I don't talk about it a lot. Right, right. I talk to myself about it all day long do you really yeah it's it's what i carry around with me what do you say to yourself i have a really crazy ability to be very very aware of how i'm feeling Mm. in 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 a lot of different circumstances and throughout my day i'm just constantly checking in with how I'm feeling, and um, and I have to. That's how I cope. That's right. how I. That's how I know if I'm okay. And I also so don't take for granted feeling at peace. Right. I. That's why I don't drink. Mm-hmm. That's why I've never done any drugs. Mm. Because for me, every moment that I can feel at peace and feel to be who I am Mm -hmm. is a gift because for so many years I couldn't and I still so here's my story again I'm now I'm I'm, okay anyway (laughs) here's my story my story is I went off to school to Vanderbilt um when I was I had just graduated from school decided I couldn't go into the acting world. It would just be too difficult. And so I was going to be the elementary school teacher. So I go to Vanderbilt. I proceed, I guess it was in November, I started not being able to get out of bed. Mm. And I thought, this is weird. And now I'm crying for no reason at all. I have no idea why I'm crying right now. And it was the first time I was away from home, obviously, for so many people going off to college. Mm -hmm. And I kind of couldn't get a grip. I was kind of leaving reality. And so I was talking to my mom a lot about it. I went to the counselor there at college and the only thing they could give me was um a drug like xanax Mm. and so they gave that to me and then that was weird and because it just knocked me out yeah it's not about depression right right. it's about anxiety but that just goes to show where we were 30 years ago right right and more backstory is my great grandfather killed himself. Mm. My grandmother, my mom's mom, had such severe depression that she had so many shock treatments, they ended up giving her a lobotomy. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's there, it's in the bloodline. Yeah, it's the DNA, yeah. And so my poor mom had to be a child of somebody who suffered from severe depression and was incapacitated with it. Right. And then to have her have to watch her daughter Mm. start to deal with that had to have been really, really hard for her. And it's a conversation I always wish I could have had with her as a mom now. Yeah. To just be like, wow, thank you. And that had to have been very hard. Right. So anyway, um, I, I am unable to take a shower. Mm. Um, I remember this sweater. I'll never forget what that sweater looked like. I wore it, I think, for seven straight days. Wow. And. Wow. 
I couldn't. And what was really interesting is I'm, I'm a very high functioning depressive mm -hmm. where I was at I was at the top of my class at Vanderbilt there. Right. I had 4.2. I was acing everything. Right. And yet I still I couldn't function. Right. So I ended up having to leave Vanderbilt because mm -hmm. I was such a mess. Mm. My mom came and packed me up and we came home. And I remember my father saying in the car, um, after the day I came home, he said, millions of kids go off to college and are okay. Why weren't you? Oh, no. And it was a lack of understanding entirely. Yeah. And I also grew up in a house where my father and I are very similar. My father's the funniest person I know. I'm not saying I'm so funny, but you're pretty funny. But the, the sense of humor is there. And we it was kind of this unspoken rule in our house that you don't cry. Mm -hmm. You don't be depressed. You and I came home and I would just go into the bathroom and curl up in a ball in the middle of the night Aww, and sob baby and sob and sob and sob and because I had to hide it mm -hmm. and then my poor mother is terrified right because she's like oh my gosh I've seen this before and now it's my daughter going right. through this so I it was a time too that no one knew what clinical depression was right nobody knew what it was um it, it wasn't a buzzword it wasn't anything um, I come home, I'm, you know, I come home to this Mormon Republican household where everybody does go off to school and does very well at school. And here I am, a total mess. Right. And I'm waking up, I can't sleep. Um, it was very seasonal um, and had to do with the time of day in that by the evening, whenever the sun started going down, it started getting really bad. Oh, really? Yeah. And it's just this feeling of you are incapacitated. And I was convinced I was doing it all to myself, like so many Aww. depressives. And um, I still struggle with that every day. You do? That oh, you're my doing this, that this is gosh, a choice yes. in some way? Yes. It's not a choice. It's well, not a cho no one would choose to be incapacitated. Right. No right. one would ever choose that. Right. Right. That's true. Right. So I come home, I am with my boyfriend still from high school, and no one is really taking me seriously in my family yet mm. that this is serious. They, they probably think, oh, it's dramatic little Paula. And um, I, it, was, it was very severe, and I couldn't get out of a dark room. I was just... I, I just would be crying for no reason. You don't know why you're crying and you don't know why you're in so much pain and you are. And you probably have shame about that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, shame. Yes. So and that's just much so shame. cyclical, right? Exactly. Shame makes you more depressed, exactly. which makes you more ashamed, which exactly. makes you more depressed. Exactly. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it was. That's exactly what it was. It, it It's a total cycle. And then I have my father totally shaming Shaming me, you, like, right? You know, I was just saying this to Halston just a few minutes ago. This great book by Brene Brown called Daring Greatly. Yeah, Have you read it's this great. book? Yes, I love Where it. she talks about the difference between shame and guilt uh -huh. and how some people attach easier to shame mm -hmm. than others. Mm -hmm. And what a, and, and shame is so hard to overcome in like the mental health sort of. It's so hard. It's so hard to overcome shame because you take on responsibility for things that are not are not your responsibility. I know. I know. I know. And and how and forgiveness or to me anyway, forgiveness is the key to getting rid of shame. Yes. To just forgive yourself and to say, This is how I'm wired. Yep. And and that's not your fault. Yep. And it took me and still takes me. It's 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 a it's a it's a daily struggle for Is me. Is it really? Uh -huh, and it's been thirty years. So, my boyfriend at the time. Here I come home. I'm fa I have failed at school because I couldn't. I failed at college, not at school. I failed at the experience, and I had to come home in December um, of my freshman year. And then my boyfriend breaks up with me, oh. and I decide I'm going to kill myself. Oh, Paula. So my. Uh, 
I go to my mom and looking back on it, and so many times this is true, it's a, I mean, not all the time, but it's a cry for help. You yeah. know, there's either, mm -hmm. you know, depending on how severe your depression is. Mm -hmm. And mine was a cry for help. It's one o'clock in the morning. I'm 18 years old. My mom, my dad drives my mom and I, I'm sitting in the back seat of the car with my mom going to Sibley Hospital um, to this mental facility. Mm -hmm. And my dad's driving the car and he said, are they just gonna put her in a straight jacket? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And I go and here I am, this 18 year old in a mental institution. Oh my goodness. And I, I have such vivid memories. There's so much I remember about that time and that experience and um, I had a really wonderful roommate I got checked in I was the youngest one there I was also the healthiest one there mm. there was a woman that was walking up and down the the hallways uh, all night long convinced she was deep throat from Watergate oh my gosh and just was ranting on and on about Richard Nixon oh my time. goodness and oh I know, I know. And there was also the part of me that was okay enough that I was an actress that I would sit there and just write down people's behaviors right. and really study them. But I get checked in at two in the morning and my roommate is a mom and she kind of rustles awake and she asks me my name and she said, the way to get out of here is to follow the structure. Make sure you go to all of the different things they offer. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can get out of here. So I, you know, I meet with the doctors. I, it, it's, it's a whole experience. And they get me on the right medication and I leave after 10 days, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was there. And with depression, if you have, I'm sure you, you have one episode, you have a 50% chance of having another depressive episode mm -hmm. and if you have two episodes you have a 75 percent so I was very very fragile and got on some medic I I got out of the hospital and was with my psychiatrist and she said well there's this new drug that has come out that is still in the studies stage, but I can get you some and we can try it. And it's called Prozac. Mm. So I was one of the first people on Prozac. Wow. And it helped yeah. to a point. Uh -huh. And basically for the past 30 years, I have been on different combinations of medication that helps me just be okay with who I am. I have had multiple, my depression is very tied in with my hormones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, what I just explained about um, the 50% chance, I have a depressive episode every time I'm ovulating and every time oh I start menstruating. Goodness, so how yeah. long do those episodes last? Four or five days. Oh my goodness. So it's one fourth of my life. Right. Basically. 25% of your life yeah. is depressed. Yeah. So when you're in that state now and, and all these 30 years of experience mm -hmm. and um, knowledge and management, how do you manage it differently than you did when you were younger? Or do you manage it differently than you did when you were younger? I know I'm going to be on the other side. Okay. So you I don't know it when I'm in it. When I'm in it, it's it's interesting. I you know what I do? Hmm. I I just take my meds. So many times I have thought I can handle this. Mm -hmm. I can handle this. That is I think an extremely important message. Mm -hmm. Is no matter what no matter what you, you think, you have to take your meds. You have to take your meds. Yeah. And it's weird because you take your meds and you feel okay. Yeah. And you're like, I don't need the meds. Exactly. And 
it's then a you go off right and about four days but my system is so sensitive that if i don't take my meds the night before then i'm bad mm. you know it, and again i'm also a very high functioning depressive one of when i went in to know i had to change my meds um, cause it was getting bad was the month that I kind of met you. Oh, really? Yeah. That world fair. I guess it was your last world fair. It was just two years ago. Yep. That would have been my last. And one. I was, I, I was crumbling inside. Your dad was ill also. Well, that happened after. Oh, okay. It was before that, that. happened after. That's and that's it. another interesting thing that happens is when something re something in real life happens yeah, yeah, yeah. that's depressing, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, this is a relief. Uh, like I have something the right that, to feel yes. this way. Now yes. that's not okay. Yeah, right. No. That's not okay. But you the have part the real of right you, all the, the part time. of you that can solve it mm. is the part that's sick. Wait, the part of you that can solve it is the part. The part that's sick. that can help you the most when you're depressed. Uh huh. Your brain. Uh huh. Your, I see. Who, you're, who you are as a functional person mean, yeah. is the sick part. I see what you mean. So I guess I know that now. Mm -hmm. I also have a tremendous support system. I have one, two, three, four. I have four people mm -hmm. that I can reach out and say, and do, right. and say, it's bad. I'm in bad shape. I'm in bad shape. So if you were to give advice... To an 18-year-old mm -hmm. going to college, crying in her dorm room, falling apart, what would you say to someone who went through exactly or, or similarly what you went through? Get to a therapist and get meds. Mm. Because, you know, there's no shame in being medicated. If someone has high blood pressure, I know. they're medicated. Diabetes, if someone has, disease. I know, I know, blah, blah, blah. But it's the truth. It's really true. It's so simple. And I, you know, it, the one thing I would like to change, I think, about our world is that people had no shame about their flaws mm. because every person is flawed. Mm. So for you to think that, I, well, society tells you your flaws are not accepted. And I think that is a shame because mm. really... Our flaws and overcoming those flaws or those shortcomings is is the is the birthplace of creativity, of yep. innovation, yep. of intelligence in some places. Yep. So those broken parts absolutely is, is what makes us strong as absolutely. a human race. So it 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 that's one of the things that really bothers me mm. is that we can't as people who care for each other say hey that's your thing i got my thing we mm -hmm. all got a thing mm -hmm. my thing doesn't need medication mm -hmm. but your thing does so who who cares mm -hmm. what does it matter mm -hmm. and unfortunately we're not there yet i don't think as a society i i could not believe i think i'd mentioned this to you before the first time i wanted to do this episode on depression i hadn't talked to you much about doing the podcast and i didn't know that you uh, suffered from depression i asked four people to do this podcast and they all four said no mm. because they didn't I want it. it they did there's so much shame around it where i think i'd have an easier time getting an addict to come on yeah you know i'd have an easier time getting a like and yet we've come so far so far we've come so far when That's i was true. on prozac nobody knew what that was nobody they were like wait why are you taking medication like can't mm. you just sleep this off can't you just find something you really like to do can't you just take a fucking shower you know what i mean yes like, i do like and i really i remember the day i saw on the news stand time magazine with a prozac pill uh -huh. on the cover and I couldn't believe it yeah. I was like holy crap people are seeing this right right people are knowing what this is right um you need to do a podcast on shame I should do a podcast do, on a, shame. do a sh podcast on shame I worked through a lot of shame did you oh yeah I worked through a lot of shame you know I was um I didn't I was the a hybrid for Brene Brown stuff mm. where as a child I didn't feel shame with stuff that happened with my mom. Mm -hmm. I was the strong person that went, yeah, that's not me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. That's you. Mm 
So I may feel bad, but I don't own that. That, mm. that didn't come from me. But I was date raped in college. Wow. And I have a great, I had a great deal of shame from that because yeah. I was too drunk. My skirt was too short. Mm-hmm. I was too flirty. My friends tried to get me to go home. Mm-hmm. And I was so hammered. I was like, yeah, I'm fucking partying. Yeah. And bad thing happened. Mm-hmm. So, and I tried to fix the bad thing with more shameful behavior. Yes. Because yes. you try yes. to correct it. Yes. And you just, you it just gets into such a worse hole. So that piece of life, I had a lot of shame. And how did you overcome that? I started um, working on forgiveness hmm. and saying, and, and compartmentalizing things and yeah. going, this part is not my fault. But this part was a bad decision. Mm-hmm. It was a bad decision to get that drunk. It was a bad decision to wear too short of a skirt. It was a bad decision to flirt with a guy. Mm. It was a bad decision not to go home with my friends. All those were my responsibility. Mm. Now, what happened from that guy was not my responsibility. He shouldn't have done that, Mm. even though I had all those negative choices before. Mm. So to be able to say I was 19, I was desperate for love because I didn't have it where it should be coming from, from my parents right, right. um i was i was trying to fit in and mm-hmm. and not mm-hmm. and feeling insecure mm-hmm. and and the it was a relationship i had been in that had not been in for a while and i was really bummed about that mm-hmm. which is why i was flirting i was trying to get you know get yeah. him back sort of yes, yes. and i was still heartbroken from my high school sweetheart mm-hmm. and so it was just a perfect storm of me being in a bad place, making bad choices, and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hmm. So part of that was my responsibility. And in saying that doesn't make me a bad person, it just makes me a, a hurt little girl. Oh. And, you know, to find the little girl in that, to go, this poor little girl was yeah. just so hurt. She was hurting yeah. so much. How could you shame her? Mm. why would you do that you you know i wouldn't do that if someone and i i started thinking a lot like if my friend came to with to me with that story what would i say right. i do that too then yeah. why wouldn't i say that to, to myself yourself. so if you're going to really be that person who can be that forgiving and accepting and compassionate to another person you have to be that for yourself or you can't really be that for another person right because you don't know how to do it you just fake it till you make it i guess that's right that's so true so i think that was what started happening for me but i don't really i can't really think of shame around anything other than that event Hmm. that event i did for a long time have some shame about how I behaved with my mom because you know my mom was really Mm -hmm. not awesome Mm -hmm. so and there were some times where I was really not awesome back Mm. you know we got in a physical altercation at one point right and I was really ashamed of that right I thought I should never have let myself get to that point and I was ashamed of myself for that but again you have to go where was that coming from yes what was that little girl feeling? Yeah. And would you beat her up for making one bad Heavens, choice? No. I mean, she's been the pressure that took to get me to that point was unmanageable yes. and, and unacceptable. And, and you know, when you're raised by somebody who has a personality disorder like my mom's, she wants you to believe it's your fault. Yeah, it is your absolutely. fault. Absolutely. Every, absolutely. Your, you draw breath which affects me negatively, yes. and that is your fault. Yes. You should not be drawing breath. Like, that was the thing oh, that I was taught. Gosh. So, But I also, at the same time, was like, yeah, that ain't true. I don't believe that. And, but after you hear that for so long, I mm-hmm. think there is a part of you that goes, hmm, maybe, mm. maybe it is my fault. That, of course, I know. You know, maybe, know. I'm not sure. I know. So to be able to s- kind of suss that out, it takes so long. I feel like sometimes I wish I could go back to my little 18-year-old self with this self and say, all these things oh, you're upset about I and know. worried about, it's not, it's okay. Know. You know, who you are is okay. But you know what? We get to do that as moms. That's true. That is true. 
But I know. Oh, the letters we could write ourselves, <laughs> our younger selves. Oh my gosh, it would have been so much easier, right? If I had had myself as a mom, I think I would have been better off. I mean, I would be fantastic. <laughs> I would be awesome. I would be a rock star. I, wait, I think I am a rock star. Oh, that's no, right. right. No, no, you are. are. You are. You are. Wait there. a minute. You would be even I, a bigger rock star than you already so, are. I'd be worldwide. It's only because I wore a tool belt. And I'm <laughs> the only girl that wore a tool belt. <laughs> oh, well, fair. Uh, oh. I do miss that community, actually. Uh, I made such a great group of friends from yeah, volunteering you did. at school. I but made you it still great. have that. I still crowd. have that. But I miss the the... Working on a project and... Working on a project, I miss mm -hmm. a lot. And I miss... Um, I miss the broader community. Like, there was this group of guys that showed up every year, f and I felt like it was for me. Oh, I felt I like it was. was. It was, I bet it was. Uh, well, I shouldn't say their names. Mm. But there were like three dads who showed up mm. every year, and I was convinced it was because That's I was there. Great. And guess what? They, it was. And I missed those three guys because I don't ever see them. That's and so I would cool. never want any kind of, rela you know, no, 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 no hanky no. panky. <laughs> I just was like, I, you know. I just grew up with boys yeah. and they're like the boys and, that's what and I'm so with. close yeah. to all my cousins at home yeah. and every time I go I just fall in with all the boys mm -hmm. and I don't have a boys group here. Right. And that and was that my boys, was group. boys group. So I kind of miss so my cool. boys. That's so cool. And they've all moved on now. They're all yeah. in middle school and different schools. Yeah. But I really do miss that about our, our little fundraiser that we yeah. built for four days every year. It was really fun. Um, I... I don't know what I think it was being a mom uh, that comment I wanted to go back and touch on something it's it's um it's interesting because it, the way I have handled my depression is that I know how to feel it and then I know how to talk to myself about it mm -hmm. but because I don't talk about it very much mm -hmm. um it's it's hard for me to then talk about it so I can talk to it. I can feel it. I can talk to it, but I can't talk about it. I understand. That um, makes sense. Um, so I'm a little all over the place with it. That's okay. Um, I'm being, I mean, for somebody that came in here and was like, I'm wildly inarticulate, I'm like proving it. Right no, you're now. not. Oh, I, I you are not as un inarticulate am. as you no, think I'm, you are. No, I'm wildly. I'm all over the place. But at any rate. You should talk to half my family. I mean, and then you would feel like you are <laughs> the most articulate <laughs> person ever. You are Barack Obama. I would say, uh, well, <laughs> um, I would say I had, I had to go. I, first of all, I would say go to a therapist and get medication, mm -hmm. but you have to do the talk therapy with it because of what we were just talking about right. with the shame and the, there's a lot to it. It's a mental disability and um, an emotional disability and you have to talk it out when I got pregnant mm -hmm. um, I had to go off all my meds Ooh la la! and so I was almost hospitalized were you really when I was pregnant with Charlie oh bad and I was monitored by um, there's a doctor named Vivian Burt at UCLA a women's clinic who is just the preeminent therapist um for women's hormonal depression and so i was on watch with her and was very lucky to be able to be a patient of hers and then um so i was under a lot of, of surveillance with her and i it i keep it all in i don't i i keep it all in my i have those four people mm -hmm. that they can see it Right. And they're like, Yoohoo, it's happening. <laughs> you hoo. <laughs> you're 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 there, aren't you? And I'm like, No, I'm fine. But um it it was bad and I had to go off all my meds and it was really it was really difficult. So then my team of doctors said, Do not do that again. Mm. Do not get pregnant again. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. But you like, did. We can't, we can't go through that. Oh, my goodness, Paula. So Mike and I were, um, and you know, I, I, Mike, when I met Mike three, three dates in, I was like, okay, I have to tell you what I walk around with all day. 
Mm. Um, and to this day, the hardest part of my day is taking my meds. I hate it. You do. I hate it. Well, it probably represents the Everything. disease, right? I have to face it. I have to face that yeah. this is something I have. Yeah. And I go through That's my day it. not facing it mm-hmm. for the most part if it's not there. Um, and I said to him on our third date, I was like, okay, this is the beast that's following me and behind me all the time. Mm-hmm. And Mike, being Mike, was just like, wow, you are really, really strong. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, do we have to have tacos tonight? I'm not really in the mood for tacos. <laughs> and it's <laughs> like, oh, this is my husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's right. like, wow, Moving on. I found him. Yeah, um, that's so funny. I had a similar experience with Bert. Did you? Yes. Uh, he on a, probably our second or third date too. I said, "I have some shit. I have some baggage. I'm not clean. I have mm-hmm. some deep, dark baggage. Mm-hmm. So I need you to know that. Like, because mm-hmm. if we're gonna move forward, mm-hmm. that's part and parcel." Mm-hmm. You can't have me without the baggage. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I got your baggage. Mm-hmm. I got it. Yeah. I'm cool. Yeah. Let's talk about your baggage. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got that yeah. baggage. Yeah. And I went, okay, this may be my guy. Yeah. I really did that, too. And mm. then, you know, proceeded to have a panic attack because he's a comic. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I can't, well, I'm never going to be able to pay my bills. <laughs> ever, ever, ever. We'll never own a house. How am I going to, how am I going to survive and be the shit job forever? Oh. But he got me. He got me. He's got my baggage. Yep. Yeah. Boy, that's amazing to feel, isn't it? <sighs> that somebody, it goes, Heaven. Oh, it's amazing. It's great. it's great. It's the moment when they're like, for me, it was like, it's when it's like, he acknowledges it. Mm-hmm. And I see and know that he acknowledges it. And then it's like, I'm not really in the mood for tacos. It's that taco moment yeah, for yeah. me. Where it's just like, oh, so we can just move on with life. Yeah, so you it's know? all good. It's like, yeah, it's that acceptance. Uh, and yeah. the not big you know, parade about it. Yeah. And is liberating. It is very liberating. It is liberating. It is you, very liberating. You feel like you can sit the bags down for a yep. minute and just sit them down yeah, for a minute. Yeah, that's so beautifully said, Leanne. You do. You just sit down. The, yeah. Just for and a minute. And you're not carrying them. Uh-uh. And if you do carry them, he'll carry one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he'll take the carry-on. He'll take the carry-on. He'll take the carry-on. I may have the trunk, but... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so... So the we doctors, about- everybody was like, you know, because I have had teams of doctors at certain points. And um, they were like, do not do this. And Mike and I talked about it. And we were like, and my sis, it, no one, my peeps, they were like, no, no, don't do this. Don't go through that again. That was really scary and bad. Mm-hmm. But we really wanted a second one for couple different reasons and so here I now am a mom of a two-year-old and off drugs Mm. and I remember driving uh one night and I was like I I think I want to go off that bridge oh goodness and and it's it's really weird it's an absence of feeling Mm -hmm. it's an absence of hope Mm. it's an absence of being able to move forward makes me feel like lead yes it Mm. is lead i and you have to trick yourself one of the things i do it or did i remember one time it was really bad when i was in new york and i remember sitting on a couch and just ruminating and just feeling like lead and feeling like i can't i can't move right now And so I tricked myself into saying, I was just like, just try to do one thing. Just try to do the laundry. Excuse me. And so I said, okay, I'm going to start doing the alphabet backwards to trick myself into, and I started doing these mental challenges Mm -hmm. to trick myself into thinking about something else so I could do the laundry. Mm -hmm. And I did. I don't know if I changed it from the wash to the dryer. (laughs) I don't know if I got that far. But you started. Um, Yeah. So somewhere in New York, there's still some laundry in the (laughs) washer um, from a tough day. But um, I, so it was bad. It was bad with Grady. And then 
um, we thought I was pregnant again um, just a few years ago. And we were like, we can't, I can't. Yeah. Well, we can't do that again. Right. That was just way. With two kids. Way too rough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine being off your meds. I didn't think about that. Being off your meds and having a two-year-old would be really, really hard. And there's different classifications of drugs that Mm -hmm. you can be on when you're pregnant. A, Bs, and Cs. And it was so bad. The the one drug that I'm on um, causes cleft palates when you're pregnant. And, um, And it got to a point where it was like, I think you have to weigh it. It's like... So there's a chance your baby can have a cleft palate, but you can fix that mm-hmm. surgically. Mm-hmm. 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 And you just have to take the chance of this. And you know, it's interesting because people give me such a hard time about my Diet Coke. <laughs> and, you know, especially out here in LA, it's like, oh, you don't know what that's doing to your body. <laughs> and oh my gosh, this is, you know, wow. Have you tried some celery juice? <laughs> and people are even also like, even Sprite, even regular Coke would be better than NutraSweet. And I always want to look at them and be like, do you know how many milligrams of how many different <laughs> meds are swimming through my body right now? No, Diet Coke's the least. Like you want to tell me that a little NutraSweet and carbonation is my biggest That's problem? Hysterical. Yeah, it, it's a little like, darling. <laughs> you got no idea. Carry on <laughs> with your terrible. judgmental self. No. That's so funny. Yeah. So that's also like my Diet Coke thing. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'll just yep. add it in the mix. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Wow. Yeah. That that sounds that sounds really intense during your pregnancy. Oh, really. Intense. It was so intense. It well, was. I know you have a hard out. So we're going to wrap up. No, that's totally fine. Um, I, I couldn't be happier to stop talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I really... I think you understand, but I really want you to understand that this helps so many people. The The emails I get about episodes where we talk about stuff like this, mm-hmm. people are like, I didn't know I was depressed until I listened right. for my last depression episode. I got so many emails saying, I felt like you were describing myself mm. in this and I had no idea I was depressed and now mm. I'm getting help. That's so So wonderful. then it's not indulgent. It's such a give. Well, it one is a on give. one, I'm 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 aware of that, and I can help. But, you know, but this is but, one on two thousand, maybe how yeah. many three thousand that you are helping too, and it may be even my perspective too with this topic was how many people have someone like you in their family that mm. they don't understand mm-hmm. that they don't that hearing it from your brother. Mm-hmm. you may go whatever we're in the same mm-hmm. household pull yourself by, by bootstraps mm-hmm. get in the shower mm-hmm. but to hear it from someone else and to go oh my god this sounds exactly like my brother mm-hmm. then they may have more compassion for that brother yeah. because really compassion is <laughs> less and less these days mm. i find and it really is the key. It is. Acceptance and it compassion. Is and empathy. It's and empathy and being able to, being able to accept, like accept something foreign to you. Yep. Not just on the surface accept it, but to really accept it and to say, I don't understand this from a visceral place. Mm-hmm. But I hear what you're saying, and I accept it as 100% true. Mm -hmm. I think that is hard for a lot of people to say, I hear what you're saying, but it's bullshit. I think that's what happens a lot of the times. And to be able to hear it and go, it's actually not bullshit. And I can never pretend to understand. That's impossible. It's like asking me to understand what it feels like to be black right i would never be able to understand what it feels like to be black right because i'm i'm not black and that's right, not right. my that's fault not your, and, yeah, right. and it's not anybody's fault it's right i could never understand that and i would never i would like to believe i would never try because that would be insulting absolutely but to say i don't understand Patriots. however i accept what you're saying as absolutely true yeah you know yeah so my hope would be 
not only do you help someone who is depressed, but that you help someone who has a depressed person in their life. Yes. Understand that person and have more compassion for that person because if the person feel if the person who's depressed feels uh, cut off or shut down from the people they love because of this condition, I would imagine that makes the condition worse. Absolutely. And that's not the point. Uh, something that you said I think that's really important for people to think about who may have depression is your four people. You don't have yeah. one person. Yeah. You have four people who go, yoo like you said. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yoo yeah. Something's off the rails. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't know it. Well, I would imagine not. Because that's the part of you that's ill. You can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. yeah. And so you need someone to go, hey, there's a forest here. Yeah. And it may be on fire. <laughs> and you do. Exactly. And I'm just like, what? I thought I was just, I thought hot there was no It's just a hot exactly. flash. No, the exactly. forest no, on it's fire. on fire. It's on fire. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so if yeah. someone is depressed, if they could find those, even three people mm-hmm. that they could say, Watch me, help me, mm-hmm. uh, not to be enmeshed with, but to nope. be to be like with Sandy. Sandy could leave tomorrow. I would feel no negativity for Sandy leaving tomorrow, mm. but I would be so grateful for what I've had with her. To find someone mm. that has a clean connection, right? yeah. just clean. It's just clean. It's just I want the best for you, and that means I'm going to help you. Right watch your forest fire right right <laughs> right right so those things are really important that you shared i think if someone else could take that piece to get yourself medicated to get yourself to talk therapy and to get yourself a support system that really truly wants the best for you and say it out loud and say it you out loud. you have to say it out loud right. you have to to create that support system right you have to be able to say i don't know what i'm feeling it's very painful mm-hmm. I, I i i am in a cloud mm-hmm. I, I or it's coming the cloud is coming the storm is coming and i don't know how to get in the shower i don't i it's starting to get bad mm-hmm. Um, to just be able to reach across and say, I hear you. Mm -hmm. This is real. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be okay. Right. And I'm not going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the key too. Yeah. I'm not going to leave. And I guess that's what our husbands did. Yeah. It's like, oh, you don't want taco? That means you want something else. Okay, right, so you're right. not going to leave. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to yeah. leave. Yeah. Because I think ultimately we're all afraid of being left. Yeah. And um, yeah, to have to find someone to say I'm not going to leave mm-hmm. is very powerful mm-hmm. and can be very challenging for people who don't understand. When I went into the hospital, because I was like Little Miss Sunshine, in, in high school and kind of was known as that really bubbly, you know, who I am yeah. on medication, like who right, I regularly right. am. Right. And, um, and I, my very best friend from high school, once I went into the psychiatric ward, dropped me. No. Yeah. And then there was another one who, bless her heart, would call and she wasn't even a close friend Mm -hmm. and she would call which is a big deal to be an 18 year old girl and not be really close to me and be at a time when depression nobody even knew what clinical depression was and now I'm in a psychiatric ward and the phone calls then would come in at a pay phone, there's a pay phone in the hallway Mm -hmm. and anybody picks up the phone. Like literally Dexter, the man that's like drooling in the corner can pick up the freaking phone. Like deep throat. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, or crazy, yeah. And so for this friend of mine, and she knows this, she she changed my life with those phone calls that she made every day to say, can you look for Paula? 
mm-hmm. for her to come to the phone. Right. And then you got Dexter or Gloria, right. you know, screaming and making up songs to get <laughs> Paula's attention. Right, And right. I'm like, just, I mean, you know, most 18 year olds are like worried about what they're going to wear at the dance. I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's a psych, <laughs> there's an, um, an insane person that thinks he's Bugs Bunny <laughs> who's trying to get me to the pay phone. Oh my God. But bless this woman's heart, Katie Ryle. She showed up. She showed up. Yep. And she wasn't leaving. Right. That's amazing. It's amazing. What a gift. I know. What a I gift. Know. I well, know. Well, I think right. you are a powerful and strong person well, as well. You are. And thank you. Are. Well, I know you are, but what am I? No, <laughs> <laughs> no but seriously, thank you so much for oh. sharing. I really appreciate it. Oh. And I hope that it helps. I think it will help at least one person. That's all that matters. That's all that matters to me. All that matters to no me No exposition too. matters to okay. me. It matters that it helps somebody. And that I learn. And I did. I learned. Oh, I don't know. But, no, okay. I did learn. All right. All right. I totally uh, learned. We'll, we'll talk about my self-doubt at once the microphones are off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Paula. All right. <laughs>